Stephen Avery is in more trouble than any white person in the history of the United States has ever been in. In a justice system designed for him to thrive, he's failed miserably twice. I, I can't even wrap my mind around it. For drivers who want to get the most out of their cars, it's Bridgestone or nothing. If making a murder was about a black dude, that shouldn't be called duh. Holy crap, was that a Sasquatch? Holy crap, was that a Hyundai? Introducing the 2013 Genesis Coupe. You won't believe it's a Hyundai. I still think this is the craziest idea you've ever had, and that's really saying something. <laughs> Just give it time, this will work. Mm. Oh, uh, Prudence, we have an emergency? Bru could just go pee in the bushes. Just make sure it's not dirt. Uh, what? <sighs> okay. <sighs> Bigfoot, you are in great danger. There are bad people coming here to kill you. You have to go to another forest. Please, please understand me. He doesn't understand. Hey, I hate to do this. Bigfoot, go away! I don't like you, you're ugly, you smell bad, and men with lots of body hair is a total turnoff. Now just go to some other forest and live your big stupid life. Just, just go away! everything can go wrong. Seems like it didn't go wrong. The motherfucker even had two hundred thousand dollars for his legal defense. That should get you off in Wisconsin. That's like OJ money. <laughs> All he needed to get off that he didn't have was a single black jury. That's all it would have took. Cause only a black dude in the United States can look at 11 other dudes and be like, I think the police did this shit.
this morning I see a storm inside of me Baby I think I'm capsizing The waves are rising and rising And when I get that feeling I want sexual healing Sexual healing It's good for me For Stephen Avery convicted of killing Teresa Halbach is offering a big reward in that case. Amanda Quintana is here now with the latest on this story. Amanda? Yes, we all know Avery was the subject of a popular Netflix documentary on his murder conviction in the mur murder of Halbach, a photographer in northeastern Wisconsin. Kathleen Zellner, Avery's attorney who specializes in wrongful conviction cases, tweeted a news release this morning announcing the $100,000 reward for the arrest and conviction of what she calls the real killer of Teresa Halbach. Excuse me, Robo, any special message for all the kids watching at home? Stay out of trouble. How can we help you, officer? Dick Jones is wanted for murder. This is absurd! That thing is a violent mechanical psychopath! My program will not allow me to act against an officer of this company. Serious charges. What is your evidence?
Bigfoot exists. Police for stuff you can't see, I know they exist. You know he exists, and they, they exist. There's more than one Bigfoot. There's species that are like a tiny Watchologist. Have you seen Bigfoot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does Bigfoot look like? Well, pretty much everyone here has probably seen it. Totally different size. You believe Bigfoot exists? You guys know they exist. All right, so I'm going to talk about the RAV4 today. There's always discussions whether or not there was one or two RAV4s. And I get a bunch of different interesting things told to me all the time by viewers and people that follow the case. And there's so many different conflicting facts that it's hard to keep up with all of them, but this video isn't going to cover every single thing that's ever been discovered or said about the RAV because I mean, just the research alone would be a nightmare trying to uncover every single thing that's ever been said about it, the various facts and whatnot. But what I am going to talk about is I want to talk about the things that I see with the RAV as it pertains to both arguments okay so i want to point out things for reasons why i think there was only one i want to point out certain things for reasons why there might have been two and personally um i'm in the middle really of both arguments i probably i, I think i'd le lean more towards there being one rav but still close to the middle and that's what we're going to talk about today is just the different things that I see, arguments that can be made, and stuff like that. Hey guys, what's up? Thank you for tuning in. You're listening to Live from the Woods. Every Sunday, it's 7 p.m. Eastern. But this week is very special because if you didn't get a chance to make the Sexual Healing Tour... A couple months ago, I'm recreating the show today, playing similar songs and playing for an entire hour. So enjoy yourself, relax, 
and get squatchy. You know what I want right now? I want some brown sugar. So here we go. Now, one of the main people that constantly get on my case about the rap is 
Richard Boyd. Now, I know a lot of you know who he is, and maybe some of you don't. I'm not conflicted with him one way or the other. He hasn't personally, you know, attacked me outside of a joking way. Action 2 News at 10. Coverage you can count on. Look, I don't think they pay attention to stuff like that, okay? She was in a nurse. She was stressed out, calling in her daughter, worried about her daughter. What, what the closest call? How is she going to say, oh, exact. It's uh, t- Mystic Teal, uh, Micah something, something. No, no, no. She's not Richard Boyd. Downtown Toyota. <laughs> and that's why And that's why they didn't put it on the, on the right. records probably and the that news, way. It's pretty blue. Good evening. We will have that story in just a moment. First, we have some breaking news from Calumet County. To be honest with you, the news did say this is not the, no, uh, but they, the they, vehicle, they but it was similar was. being right. body shape is what, you know, right. and that's what they were talking about. Thank you for calling Larry H. Miller dealership. Due to COVID-19, the sales operations will be closed until April 8th. Our service and parts operations remain open to service our customers. Please press 1 to be connected to the service department. Please press 2 to be connected to the parts department. We appreciate your patience and understanding during this difficult... But you really have to pay attention to that. Sheriff Jerry Poggle called us in the last two hours for our help in finding a missing 25-year-old Hilbert woman. He's calling their disappearance suspicious. Our Jason Zimmerman live in our newsroom now with all the details. Jason? I'm not sure where I took this screenshot from. Somebody must have posted this. Twitter, Reddit, Facebook maybe. Richard Boyd. I probably. Bill, 25-year-old Teresa Marie Halbach was last seen Monday afternoon. This is a picture of Teresa. She was last seen Monday afternoon in Manitowoc. Is, is this a Toyota what? RAV4. RAV4. Her close friends tell us tonight no one has heard from her, which is very unusual. She- Hey, Tom, Steve here at Bogles Auto Repair in Cheney. Hey, what's going on? 
She also has not showed up for work or her home. Hey, I gotta find out what, what uh, original colors were on this Toyota RAV4. Friends say they've tried calling her cell phone, but her voice mailbox is full. Uh, yeah, like for like that. You know, okay, let me see here. Um, the last eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Teresa Hallbach is five foot six, about 135 pounds. She has light brown hair and brown eyes. Okay, we got X71130444. She was last seen wearing blue jeans, a white button down shirt, and a summer jacket. And what I need to know is what uh, the door handles came out factory stock color. The Calumet County. Sheriff says she was driving a, a 1999 dark green Toyota RAV4 like this one. License plate SWH582. Again, this is 20. Dark turquoise. 25-year-old Teresa Marie Hallbach from Hilbert. Dark turquoise. She was last seen Monday. Yeah, K95 is what it shows. <laughs> this is it. Toyota Vindicator, and this yeah. is it, this when you when you put this in, you do see that the the uh color was uh, the paint code color is 760. The Calumet County Sheriff is calling her disappearance suspicious. K95. On the handle which is mystic teal mica it's not blue or green it's actually mystic teal mica if you've seen teresa please call the calumet county sheriff's department yeah. okay dark turquoise but they didn't put that out there because <laughs> reporting from the newsroom jason zimmerman action 2 news i don't know if everybody would understand what a mystic teal mica car might look like yeah exactly <laughs> side of a joking way he does get a little carried away attacking others but he is constantly on my case This rap is
If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. You are listening to the Stephen Avery series. This is part 15, The Rav 4, part 3. I am your host, Bruce McGuire. And Johnny Mills. And today we're going over even more oddities regarding Teresa Hallback's supposed RAV4 that was found on Avery's salvage yard and all of the bizarre circumstances surrounding that, including one of the biggest mind shocks of the case yet. Was it really found by Pam of God? <laughs> And what evidence exists for it being found earlier by different individuals who actually reported it? What do you think about that, Johnny? <laughs> yeah, that's... that's sketchy. <laughs> yeah, but before we get to that, we have plenty of more to go over and things that just simply don't add up in this case, of which there are many. If you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. If you like the podcast, hit the like button. Feel free to share it across social media platforms. And you can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and Patreon. And patrons do get priority in case and subject requests for the podcast. All right, so let's dive into it. So there's a lot of sketchy aspects to this case. We discussed in the previous few episodes whether or not Teresa's RAV4 was Mystic Teal, Forest Green, like blue, green, red, whatever. You know, Ken Kratz actually went down the gauntlet and named it almost every single color there is just to cover the spectrum. But what do you, some people actually believe that even photographs admitted into evidence were photoshopped and random photographs were photoshopped throughout this entire thing. So is the most famous photograph of Teresa Hallback's RAV4, is that photoshopped? I mean, some people point to the weird reflections, the, uh, the mo- like, there appears to be some kind of blur at her feet. I mean, what do you think about all this? These are supposed to, supposedly this is a professional photographer working for a professional photography business, which we will, we've touched upon this on who took this picture, what the associations were, and coincidental things with the timeline with the business just being shut down and the timeline of the trial and all this weirdness. But real quick, let's look at the picture. Does it seem kind of strange? I'm looking. <laughs> um, so you're saying the reflections are kind of weird. Oh, yeah, that back yellow green circle. That's supposed to be clouds? That's kind of weird. Yeah, the yeah I mean, it does kind of look cloudy that day anyway. It almost looks like... Yeah, it's, yeah even like the flash, like... I think the flash should just be in one point, right? Depending on where it's coming from, not three different flash points. I mean, I guess that depends on what it's being reflected off of. Like, how many... What's around that? There looks like there's a car... Is there a car right behind the person taking the photograph? Are there other reflective surfaces to the left and the right? I mean, there shouldn't be, unless yeah. it was some kind of staged photograph and they got reflect. They brought out, like, a bunch of reflectors or something. <laughs> yeah, I see the, the blue circle now, the oval, whatever that is, a uh, little blurriness. So it could be motion blur, but it's kind of like... Like How fast? Does she look like she's moving that fast? Does she look like she's like sprinting out of her car? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of weird shadow too, like under her camera and uh, at the bottom of her jacket, the back of her jacket. I mean, would it would it really look like that? I don't know. I don't know. Like this whole photo seems strange. Was it a manipulation? Some people say, oh look, it was this color and this, but. Are we taking on blind faith that this whole Teresa Hallback situation, not that she wasn't a real per- person, I mean, people have done their research, they found photographs of her in school and all these things, she was definitely a real person, you know, obviously that was one of the most insane, preposterous, I mean, although if she was a made-up person, I mean, if that's what the truth is, that's what it is, I mean, we're not going to appeal to incredulity and fallacies, but it appears there's plenty of evidence to corroborate she was indeed a real person.
go on to page three. This is some crazy shit. And I know Casey has already said this in one of her videos, but I'm gonna have to say it again. What the fuck? It says right here on page three of this. Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office Summary. Evidence seized. Toyota. RAV4. Dark green. Utility. On November 3rd. Evidence seized on November 3rd, Teresa's car. What is 
that about? Good evening. I'm Christiane Amanpour, and tonight we are excited to- Thank you for joining us for our joint interview here on CNN. I'm Nancy Grace. Tonight, we have Stephen Avery. He is one guilty son of a bitch. <laughs> Nancy, generally I don't like to make outlandish assumptions before actually conducting the interview. Okay, well, um, you know what, Christy? Can I call you Christy? No. Well, I want to say something, Christy, because usually when someone's guilty, I know it. This ain't my first rodeo. I am a prosecutor. I can tell a lie when I see one. <laughs> right. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for having me. You, sir, are guilty. My client is innocent. He is a murderer, and he is a disgusting human being. You chopped up that young woman, and you set her on fire. What do you have to say for yourself, Stephen? I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Innocent? Oh, innocent as a prom queen with her ankles up around her ears. Police! Nancy! I don't understand any of this. I have an idea. How about I ask questions first, and then after I'm finished, you can have a go. All right. All right, it is your show. Take it away. Exactly. Thank you. I'll just do it better, but it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> Stephen, I understand that you have found some evidence that undisputably proves your innocence. Yeah, you know, yeah. After tonight, there won't be any doubt as to his innocence. We actually... You sliced up that poor girl. You threw her in a burn pit outside of your trailer and you burned her bones. Guilty! Guilty! Nancy! Just let him argue. Let him fight. Let's let him speak. How, how about that? Yeah, Jolly Rancher. Stephen, can you please share with us the evidence that was found that proves your innocence? Yeah, you know, yeah. Tonight, Mrs. Amanpour, we are excited to announce Teresa Halbach has been found alive. What a revelation! Teresa, welcome. Thank you. I just want to say, everybody, I am so sorry about all this confusion. I went on a trip to Cabo, took some terrible shrooms. Next thing I know, I end up in a Mexican prison. Thank God I finally got out with the help of some guy named, uh, 
Oh, El Chapo. Yeah. Sean Penn was there, too. He gave me this perm. Oh, I've had my keys the whole time. I guess I didn't do it. Absolutely incredible. Nancy, what do you have to say now? You need to look forward, please. Look at the camera. His sweat was on those keys. He is guilty. Guilty as hell. I'm hungry. Just hold it. Okay, we'll stop. We'll get lunch. Good night. Good night.
is not dead.
Hi guys. Okay, so right now, I guess I'm going to do my little comeback. Um, it's been a minute <laughs> since I've made a video, but I've been having a lot of people ask me what I think about making a murder or two, and I guess I just have had a lot to say, but I have been leaving comments on Twitter and Facebook and um, not really seriously thinking of doing a video until people just really started asking me, what do I think, what do I think, what do I think? And so something that triggered me a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was that Kathleen Zellner did her Twitter Q&A, was um, one of the questions she was asked about was the date plan, or something about what does she think about the date plan and how it's involved. Um, her response is actually what triggered me to seriously consider making a video. video because um, I was I was so concerned with her answer that I because I couldn't believe that um, either she maybe had missed it or she ruled it out and we don't know why or how but it's still a very big issue for me so I wanted to let me just read what she wrote She said, um, she said, the date planner is an independent issue from the murder of Miss Halbach. It was no likely be connected to moving the RAV4 and accessing its contents. All of Ms. Halbach's paperwork was removed from the RAV4 before it was found.
is not dead. Let's see. Steve and Avery and Brendan Duffy are innocent. They didn't kill Teresa, but Teresa's still dead anyway. Hmm. How does that fucking work? So we got Teresa's new phone records, and we notice that Denise Coakley has talked to Teresa at around 11.30 on the 31st and said, I'd like to set up an appointment with you on Tuesday, November the 1st at noon. And Denise said, when I talked to Teresa, she said, oh, I'm driving. Let me pull over and drop this down. So Teresa pulls over and she jots down Denise noon on November 1st, okay? So she's in her car. Then we discover that Steve Speckman calls Teresa just about an hour after Denise's call, okay? So it's around 1245, and he tells her that he's got a couple vehicles he wants her to photograph. So Teresa jots down Steve and Sheboygan and then the vehicles and his phone number and he confirms that she's driving in her car. It's now a quarter to one, okay? And so just reconstructing the time frame in which she arrived at her next appointment. There isn't time for her to have gone all the way back to her house with the day planner, left it at her house, and then left again. It's the schedule's too tight for her to arrive at Schmidt's. Scott Laydorn said that he found the day planner at Teresa Halbach's residence and that it was from the Outlook program on the computer. And it was before Teresa wrote on it, when she was out on the road, talking to Denise Coakley and Speckman and drove to Schmidt's. So she's at the Schmidt's house, and then she goes to the Zippers, and then she goes on to the Avery's. Her day planner is in the car with her because she never goes back home. There isn't time. So, how does Ryan Hillegas get this piece of paper unless he has access to Teresa's car after she's been to the Avis? So, some of this is going to be in response to some of the things he's constantly messaging me about and stuff like that. So, here's the picture, and all of these pictures, by the way, they're, none of them have been edited. They all come, to my knowledge, they all come from StephenAveryCase.org, every single one of them. So, this picture we've all seen now.
Hello. I'm making this video today to point out a few things about the November 6th interview of Brendan Dassey. First off, this is all happening one day after the, the RAV4 has been discovered. At this point in time, they couldn't have possibly had any evidence that pointed to Brendan to justify the interrogation. In fact, we now know that they never found any trace of Brendan in the RAV4 or in Steven's trailer. But Deputy O'Neill couldn't have known that at the time. Nor did he have any evidence pointing to Brendan at the time. Deputy O'Neill is a sheriff with the Marinette County Sheriff's Department who pulled over Brendan with his brother Blaine while they were on their way to get some photos for the Crivet's cabin. I listened to this interview for the first 20 minutes and it seemed mostly normal. Just law enforcement asking normal questions in pursuit of a missing person's investigation. However, around the 20 minute mark, that all changes and Deputy O'Neill begins telling Brendan what happened. This first clip is mostly harmless. Remember that girl taking that picture. Okay, if not the boss, it's a beautiful day, it's daylight, everybody sees it. You do too. Do you remember seeing that girl standing there taking a picture? Brandon, come on. You do not know. Now that's no big deal. I think we can all agree that Teresa was there, whether you believe she left or not. But what this does show is that the deputy is beginning to tell Brendan what to say. And then 30 seconds later, he says this. Uh, it's either yes or no. I mean, I'm not putting nothing in your mind. You tell me if you remember that girl standing there taking pictures. Okay, well that's good, right? At this point, O'Neill becomes very aggressive and begins asking Brennan about when he got off the bus. O'Neill then asks Brennan if he saw Teresa, to which Brennan responds, yes, he saw her taking pictures of a van. What happened to that girl? She didn't leave. What happened to that girl? She stayed there five minutes and she left. Oh, that's what you're being told to say. Brennan. What happened to that girl? Brandon. What happened to the girl, Brandon? Why don't what I... happened to the girl? No, that's all I know. She got off the bus, you walked on the driveway. She's still there, right? You see her, don't you? Yeah. Who else is out with you? When I listen to this, when I listen to that, and I hear Brandon ask, do you guys think he did it? It's because Brennan's beginning to realize that their questions are suggesting that he knows his Uncle Stephen did something to Teresa. I believe upon realizing this, he asks the question out of sheer shock. Forty seconds later, O'Neill asks Brennan about the question. Question, Brennan. You think he did it? No, you just asked me that question. Why would you ask me that? Did what? 
that he raped her? Did she go into his house, Brandon? Maybe it's, maybe it's because a uh, traffic stop turned into an interrogation, and 25 minutes in, Brendan just feels like he's being attacked. He's scared and confused, and he really doesn't believe his Uncle Stephen was involved. And he also notices that O'Neill is becoming very agitated, so he starts guessing. He remembers the rapes that his Uncle Stephen was accused of before. If law enforcement can bring his Uncle Stephen then, he probably figures if he says that, O'Neill will finally leave him alone. It's pretty clear in the way that Brendan phrases all of his responses as a question that he's grasping his straws and hoping that O'Neill will leave him alone. A bit later, Brendan says that Teresa left the property, and this is O'Neill's response. Concerned. Did something happen that shouldn't have happened? Well, why are you lying to me about that? Accusations of lying with no evidence on Brendan? Dirty pool. Don't worry about that. That truck did not leave that place. It's back out the driveway and take the left. Once again, O'Neill tells Brendan she didn't leave. And then he follows with this a short time later. And nobody's saying that Stephen did this, okay? Nobody's saying that. What? Are you freaking kidding me, O'Neill? You've, you've said, you've constantly been asking whether or not she went inside Stephen's trailer, and you've said several times that she never left there. Two plus two equals four, Chief. Is that girl what, bro? Is she? Yeah, you do know, Brown. Are you involved in this? She's just constantly badgering, or calling him a liar, or just completely dismissing his words. But Brendan still has sympathy for his Uncle Stephen. I love that Brendan brings this up. If you've wrongfully convicted a man once, shouldn't you possibly take a little extra care to make sure you don't repeat that mistake? Or at least give the appearance of fair play? Apparently not. The fact that this is all happening on November 6th, one day after the RAV4 was found, really reminds me of the way that they reported Stephen Avery as a murder suspect 154 minutes after Teresa Hallback was reported missing. I will leave a link to Sean Atwood's video down below, by the way, so that you can check that out. Meanwhile, let's check in with O'Neill. Where'd they go? She didn't leave. Brandon, she didn't leave. So we're going to listen to this stuff on Common Sense Central called Rebutting Amber. I'm going to go through each episode and rebut, rebut. Well, it's on and on. Here they come. Up to the road. After 18 years, making a murderer is a national obsession. A riveting, visually stunning masterpiece of documentary filmmaking. But it's also one of the more slanted, one-sided pieces of storytelling in recent memory, establishing its narrative that an innocent man was twice framed within the very first two minutes of the series. We knew he was innocent. We knew he was innocent. Law enforcement despised Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery was a shiny example of their inadequacies, their misconduct. It was like the same old Steve was back. He was happy, he was smiling. I did tell him he'd be careful. Okay, folks, so now I'd like to get into a, uh, 
an area that's very close to my heart. Now, I spent the majority of my life um, training for a career in criminal justice. I originally wanted to be a, a criminal law attorney. And, you know, circumstances, life happens, and I wound up not going to law school. <laughs> but that doesn't, um, that doesn't take, take away from my original passion, which is law, more specifically criminal law, more specifically homicide. And I did train for a while there um, to be a homicide detective. I uh, have a criminal justice degree with a focus on forensic analysis. And, <clears throat> you know, so this was a very big deal to me. Hello, Sean Apple here. This is my passion for London. The first in my Making the Murder question series. The question I received was, what do I actually think happened to the King of Usually when there's a murder, it's committed by someone they know. Ex-boyfriend, family member. So I would put ex-boyfriend at the top of my suspect list. According to a co-worker, he was allegedly stalking another co-worker at his place of employment, which was a nurse. If he was stalking Teresa, then perhaps Teresa had found a new love interest. Maybe he committed the crime of passion, which is quite common. We also have the zipper theory, whereby supposedly zippers was the last stop. Cell phone records show things that had up as Kratz said. May have been at Zipper's. Zipper may have suspected her for his trespassing and shot and killed her, thinking she was a trespasser. So, they're my two main suspects. Still got the German suspect on the list, he's not completely off yet. He's threatened to sue me and he's threatened some other people online. His ex wife has completely changed her tune about what she said originally that was put on the internet. And we know that people who completely flip flop like Stephen Avery's ex flip flop and said he was guilty. To me, that arouses more suspicion, so I'm still Steve Avery? Yeah, roll up. You're out of there. By order of Sheriff James. Gary? Yeah. Bagel. And investigator Wendy Baldwin. When they flew over the Avery Cyber Yard on the 4th, of November 2005 and took a aerial photograph, which proves that Chris Hallbuck's 1999 Toyota RAV4 was not where Pam Strom found it for that day. Also, does not show a Subaru or a Skidoo outside of the garage. Sing it for real now. Do this one for the cow. Just heaven and hell for you. On and on, on and on, it's yeah. On and on, on and on, it's yeah. On and on, on and on, it's a big one.
Throw away. 
If we accept lies big and bold Oh, we forget We live on Avery Road How would you feel if you were charged 
with a capital offense. State's case against you I lacked all common sense. How would you feel in a court of law full of arrogant pretense? And how would you feel? You could not be saved by truth, the absolute defense. All truth should be the absolute defense. How would you feel left all alone? No attorney or parents Left to the world To tear at your bones Although they lack any evidence Comes at a cost At freedom Justice is expense To lock up two men Away for life Although they're innocent How would you feel That you could not be saved by truth The absolute defense Truth should be the absolute defense.
By the name of a dead man stays And I write songs about the Avery case Because for me It's a total disgrace To see freedom And justice laid to waste While so many see but simply turn face We all know money was at stake But this was more about saving face They got it wrong in 85 He was freed by DNA There was no way they could let it end that way They cooked up a plan To make him pay Convicted old Avery But there's so many anomalies That simply fall apart Under basic scrutiny And he's shaking that cabinet 
and out pops the key. Recreate that, my friend, because I want to see. Now I'll keep singing, I got dozens more. No matter how much you beg or implore. Oh, I'll keep singing till they unlock those doors. Yeah, I'll keep singing, cause that's what freedom's for. Oh, I'll keep singing, because that's what freedom's for. Alright, I have one more song left. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. I believe in all of y'all and you're very beautiful. I hope to see you right back here next Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern, live from the woods.
you so much for believing in me. Make sure to check out my merch at www.saxquatch.com. I'll make a post about it here in a second. And see you next week. Hello, everybody. You have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murder on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of making a murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned. And in the future, I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. So, obviously we're here to talk about a big announcement, right? Everybody wants, to, everybody wants to talk about that. So, I have some thoughts, but I want to say something first. I see some people out there who saw it and, you know, were kind of excited by it. I know there was some people out there that, hey, Sila, Sila. Uh, hey everybody, by the way. But I also saw other people out there that really took an attitude that I, I, you know, really didn't agree with, and that was that they felt like Zellner was reaching him or something like that. I, I don't, I don't see it. Um, it's, you know, I was making a comparison where it's like if you're in a football game in the fourth quarter and you're only up by a field goal or you're down by a field goal. You're not going to start pulling your first string, right? No, you're going to push harder. You're going to pull out all the bag. You know, you're going to reach deep into your bag of tricks. And, you know, or you're deep into your, you know, play calling book, as it were. Right? And you're going to pull out something unique, special. Well, that's what's happened here. Zelner is just using another tool. He's just trying to, you know... You know, obviously, if, if somebody can come forward with some type of smoking gun, that makes this whole process a lot more streamlined. So it makes sense. Not only that, is that, well, we're going to talk about the amount of money and stuff, but we're going to talk about a lot of things, but let's say hi to everybody first. So, hi everybody in the chat, how's everybody doing? Hey Jerome, hey Linda, how you doing? Hey Bean. Hello Larry. I think it's a brilliant thing, and I'm going to explain why. 